Hello and welcome to the Big Bass Podcast, the fishing show where size matters. My name is Ken Duke. And I'm Terry Battisti. Our producer and engineer is Nathan Benson. In this episode of the Big Bass Podcast, we'll be talking with Stephen Barden, director of the Major League Fishing Fisheries Management Division and one of the world's most foremost experts on the black bass. He's going to help us understand how to find the best waters in your area to catch a trophy bass. Yeah, Stephen's got a bachelor's degree in freshwater biology from Charleston State University and a master's degree in fisheries science from Texas A&M. Uh, in addition to his work with Major League Fishing, Stephen owns a private lake management company called Texas Pro Lake Management. He's written for a bunch of different bass fishing platforms, is a member of any meaningful fishing organ fisheries organization you can think of, and he's personally grown largemouth bass up to 17 and a half pounds. Let's bring him in. Stephen, welcome back to the Big Bass Podcast. Yep. That's two two episodes. I feel like I'm the uh, most highly anticipated guest ever, right? We're, we're actually a whole train. You're back to me. At, at yeah. this point, we're wondering if we can do a show without you, Stephen. So thank you. Oh. Thank you for keeping <laughs> thank us Thank you for afloat. having me. This is awesome. Yeah. Well, this, you know, last time you gave us a ton of information about what it takes to grow uh, a, a truly giant bass or potentially a record sized bass, whether world record, state record, or even just a personal best. This time, though, we're going to change gears a little bit and, and get into some practical how to. You know, what can, can uh, a good angler, a great angler, uh, an average angler do to uh, enhance his chances of going out there and catching a new personal best? Yeah, I, I love this topic because I, I, I don't know that anybody's ever really tackled it this way. Uh, I don't think so. It, we're, we're used to, may... we, we go bravely and boldly where no podcast has gone before, Stephen. That's who we it's, are. It's called, in order to get published in science, you have to do something novel, right? And we're, that's what we're trying to do here at the Big Bass Podcast. So. That's right. And, and also, um, I think to the theme of the show and so many of the, the fish that you guys have researched, um, there might be a few fishing stories in here. There might be a few stretches of the imagination. <laughs> Amen. Never, never. <laughs> now, you know, uh, just trying to pick a place to start here because your your knowledge is incredibly extensive, Stephen. Uh, one of the things I noticed when I scanned the list, particularly of world record largemouth bass, not so much the other species, but largemouths, is how many state records came from waters less than 100 acres in size. And many right. of them from farm ponds of just an acre or two. What is it about these small waters that makes them so conducive to growing record-sized bass? And, and what can what can an angler like me learn from that? Yeah, I love, that's a great place to start. Um, small impoundments offer an opportunity because you can control so many variables in, in small things, like the introduction of a new forage fish or a little bit of harvest or new genetics can change that fishery really quickly and therefore result in better quality fish uh, if the right decisions were made. So a lot of times these small impoundments, um, it, it may not even be anything we're doing. It may be weather that, that creates these changes within the environment that allows these exceptional fish to grow. Where a reservoir, reservoir has a lot of potential because it's so stable, but all the components have to already be there. Think of a lake fork. A lake fork has all the components that are there. So it continuously grows these exceptional fish. Where other reservoirs that are maybe very similar and have been stocked in the same way are missing something, even weather or water quality, that prevents them uh, from, from growing these exceptional fish. So I love the fact that we're going to talk a lot about small impoundments. Uh, it's going to go a lot into habitat because habitat is super important understanding where to find these fish you know which which reservoirs can produce them but a small impoundment's a great place to start and i love that it's so, right in your wheelhouse in your in your private business you're you're doing a lot of private lake management and stuff stuff like that so so that's something you spend a significant amount of your time doing is trying to help people get their small waters in order so that they can produce trophy bass that's exactly right yeah you know there's like i said there's last show i said there's those really five variables I think, you know, for finding uh, these water bodies that are going to have these exceptional fish, it, it's probably impossible for us to know the genetics of the fish within those small environments as an angler, right? 
but we can look at things like forage. We can look at things like habitat. Uh, we can make some assumptions on water quality and we can understand maybe not necessarily harvest as the entire fish meat, but angling pressure we can understand. And small impoundments, you know, typically offer lower angling pressure if they're private. If they're public waters, uh, it may be higher angling pressure, but maybe not for those trophy sized fish. Is there an optimum size lake or pond to produce, a, a, let's say in the south it would be a, a double digit fish, but in the north it may be a six or an eight pound fish. Is there a, a yeah. specific size body of water that will produce those big fish? That's a great or question, Terry. So every fishery has a carrying capacity, right? A, a total pounds of fish that it can produce and we could divide that up into surface acre if we needed to. But uh, at some point, we're going to get 10 to 20 surface acres to where we have a high enough carrying capacity that we are going to have a percentage of fish that are going to be exceptional fish. Anything smaller than 10 acres, you can still produce those fish. You're just going to produce less of them. So if we said, for example, that we could produce 100 pounds of largemouth bass per acre, if we have a one acre pond, we can only have 10 largemouth bass that are 10 pounds. That's our 100 pounds used up really quickly. In a 20, 30, 40 acre lake, we can produce more of those fish because that carrying capacity goes further. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I, and a lot of these, uh, I grew up in, on a farm in right. kind of very remote South Carolina. And, uh, I didn't realize it at the time. I thought if I caught a really good fish out of a particular pond, it might only be a couple of acres, that it was probably loaded with multiple big fish. But right. most typically, unless it's being extensively managed, that's just not true. How much uh, biomass and, and particular bass are, are likely to be in a, a, a typical, not heavily managed farm pond of say five acres? Right, that's a great question, Ken. And and I'll relate it to a lot of times for my private job, whenever we go and survey, we electrofish. We put electricity into the water. It brings fish to the surface. We electrofish and we look at a percentage of the population. And sometimes whenever we do these on these farm ponds, these grandfather ponds, um, we catch a lot of stunted bass. And then we catch one or two exceptional individuals. The individuals that have figured out how to compete, Maybe they figured out how to consume those other bass. And we do see this a lot whenever we try to renovate a lake using fish toxicant like rotenone. We will see one or two exceptional fish. Now, when you get that five-acre lake, you really could start talking about having, if you're just a largemouth bass fisher, you could, you could have five to 700 fish in that water body. Wow. Or if you have multiple predators or a lot of harvest uh, occurring, you can have a very small number. I did a five-acre lake renovation uh, a few years ago that had channel cat within the fishery and the channel cat made up 80 percent of that biomass so whenever we started yep. to we actually put the toxin in we ended up with about 75 largemouth bass and we had been really upset because we couldn't get those bass to grow uh effectively for for several years so that was what led us to to renovating that lake but we ended up having too many channel catfish. You can have the same thing with species like gizzard shad. Gizzard shad, um, as they grow larger, they compete against juvenile largemouth bass for forage. It's, it's this weird thing that happens where you can have a fishery that's locked up in gizzard shad and you have the exceptional gizzard shad and not many largemouth bass. So there's a lot of variables, wow. Ken, that, that matter whenever we're talking about these extremely small bodies of water. But if I was uh, an angler and I was trying to target, uh, it is a good place to start, but it's probably a five acre or smaller is probably not where I would start unless it's it's managed in some way. Yep. So now, most... what, what is the, the typical lifespan of a lake? Uh, I started water quality when I was in grad school. And one of the things that happens in natural lakes is eutrophication. Right. You know, you, you get, uh, the, the, the seasonal cycles, you know, you get weeds, you know, aquatic growth in the winter or in the summer, and then it dies in the, in the winter and provides a biomass that settles to the bottom. And over years and years and years, you know, the, the lake will essentially just become ground again. So right. what is the optimal lifespan for a pond to, to produce good fish? 
Yeah, that's another great question. I mean, this is a science episode here. So <laughs> whenever you impound a reservoir, uh, whether it's small impoundment, pond, or a, a large reservoir, you're basically starting a clock where sediment and that biomass of vegetation every year fills it in. And, you know, that clock depend, depends on depth, how long that would take. But what you end up with is that as a process occurs, you have your lake becoming too fertile. Um, and so then you start having these water quality issues that limits growth. So it's impossible to answer your question with a number, Terry, because it actually depends on your watershed more than anything else. So okay. I would have to look at what region of the country are you in, annual rainfall, how much sediment's occurring. Maybe do you have a dairy down the street? Like what all is happening to increase that fertility? But you get to a point where you have what's called biologic oxygen demand. And the biologic BOD. oxygen, yep, BOD within the body of water is dictated by the organic matter that's in it in the decomposition process along with the fish or animal biomass and so you have these two things that compete the older the lake is the higher that bod becomes and then the more vulnerable mm -hmm. the lake is to summertime fish kills so you do have yeah go ahead Terry. i was going to ask you're talking about bod do you do you do cod or chemical oxygen demand also we don't typically focus on it in small impoundment management. Uh, uh -huh. We do water water quality uh, parameters like, uh, you know, your phosphorus, nitrogen. We we look at pH, alkalinity, things like that every single month. But we don't really dive into chemical oxygen demand as often. Um, it's just it's not one of those management strategies that's really needed. Okay. Let's change gears a little bit. Although I I do believe that uh, for a lot of people, your best chance at a giant fish is probably in a small private fishery due to fishing pressure issues and things like that. But let's let's change gears a little bit. When I was a kid, growing up in South Carolina, one of the things I did, Stephen, was I kept track of every giant bass I heard about, everything over ten pounds, and I made a list of of where they were coming from. And I felt like that informed me uh, of my best places to go and and chase a, a big fish. What are some other cues that uh, an angler can use to help identify a place that either does or does not have meaningful trophy potential? Yeah, I love, I love it. So I've been thinking about this a lot. And one of the things that I think is kind of underestimated for anglers trying to identify which fishery to go to is seasonal vegetation growth. And I'm going to bring it down to what we know about aquatic plants or macrophytes. Um, aquatic plants, they create this environment for largemouth bass that both allows their forage to escape predation and allows the bass to ambush forage when it comes out of vegetation. And luckily, we have enough research, you know, through generations that we know that largemouth bass, their abundance growth rate and size increases to a point with vegetation growth. Now that point is between 25 and 30% surface coverage. After that 25 to 30%, and that, that depends on species, so there's some, some variance in there. But after that, the largemouth bass home range shrinks. It becomes a more lethargic fish and its growth rate plummets. So as we increase vegetation density above 30%, of an area, our chance to catch more fish decreases, so there's less fish available, which could mean that there are exceptional fish in the environment, but they're going to be underweight. So for an angler, if if I was really astute to Google Earth, to you know mapping things, um, what I would look at is what percentage of the lake is covered in vegetation. This would be super important for you in Florida. Yes, I, is, I that is that a is that emergent vegetation or uh, vegetation that doesn't get past the surface? Yeah, so we, or, we have categories of vegetation. I would, I would lump emergent vegetation, which is vegetation with a rigid stem that extends out of the water column. I would lump that with submerged vegetation, which has a flaccid stem and does not extend out of the water column. Those two combined would be that percentage I'm talking about. I would exclude floating plants and algaes algaes because they're so variable and weather dependent 
and floating plants because they start to reduce uh, things like oxygen within the water as they increase in density and they can be moved by wind. So they're not predictable of the home range of a fish. Uh, so I'm using emergent and submerged plants combined, but that home range uh, with 30% coverage and every, every major brand of sonar right now will map for you aquatic vegetation in an area. And as an angler, even on a kayak, if you, if you just pick a cove and you map it really quickly and you find, uh, you know, percentage volume and you, you say it's less than 30% or 25 to 30%, that's going to be your maximum growth. And that, right at that peak of where the home range will start shrinking, that's where you what, target fish. What a wow. fantastic tip. That's uh, insane. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's, that's remarkable. Yeah, that's all right. If I, if I look down, I'm, I'm taking notes frantically. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I, the reason I asked that is that where I grew up in Southern California, we had a lot of parks that had cattails lining right. the, the shoreline. And it was virtually impossible to fish some areas of the lake because of the cattails on the shoreline. We couldn't fish the other side. Right. Uh, and we always thought that, oh my gosh, if we could you know, just get to the, no boats allowed, mind you, right. if we could just get to the outside of those cattails on a, in a boat or a float tube or something that we would be able to, and, and finally, uh, you know, you get to be 13, 14 years old and you know, you're, you've become a man uh, so to speak, and you decide to put the black clothing on and paint your face black and go out in the middle of the night in a float tube and illegally fish these lakes. And then it, we were just blown away that, holy crap, it, it's no better here where we thought we were going to whack them than it is, right. you know, in other areas of the lake that were open. So that yeah. just I'm glad he brought that me. dressing in black and covering his face back to fishing. I was I was concerned there for a moment. Uh, <laughs> in an earlier yeah. program, when we were talking about uh, about the necessary elements to get a bass to a big size, Stephen, you talked pretty extensively about uh, needing uh, an abundance and diversity of forage. Yes, sir. Uh, is that would that also be true just uh, generally when you're looking for an ideal uh, body water to fish? Yeah, I would, I would focus on forage. Um, very few states do forage stocking programs. One of them that does is Arkansas. They have a thread fin shad stocking program. So if I was an angler and I knew that my state was continually stocking forage, that might be an indicator of a fishery that is on an upswing because there's new forage. Or maybe I'm in a state where a new forage has become available for a completely different reason. Like, uh, you know, the northern fisheries where gobies are now available. That is a fundamental change in that fishery that's going to spark increased growth. Uh, conversely, if I'm in an area that I never see forage stocking, whenever I'm, I'm on my electronics, I'm not seeing forage in the area. I'm not seeing shad. I'm not seeing bluegill move. I'm not seeing spawning beds. That's the wrong area to be in, right? The, the fish are going to follow forage. So ironically, uh, if a, if a non-native species is introduced to a body of water and everybody's singing the blues about what long-term deleterious effects it might have, the, the big bass angler could see it as an opportunity. Yeah, any, I mean, not any fish. I mean, you could take fish that are, any fish that is within the mouth gape of the largemouth bass, right, that it can right. consume. Got Those it. would be relevant because that could become a unique forage item. Terry gave the example last time I was on the show of, of the rainbow trout. You know, if we knew the trout trucks were coming to very specific fisheries, we could follow those around. And a lot of states stock rainbow trout. They just do it in a very different way than California did. They focus on small impoundments. Uh, and some of those small impoundments are going to really produce quality fish. And you talked about uh, when you're, if you're in a boat you have and you have some sonar electronic equipment and you can sort of get a feel for the level of, of bait out there. Uh, is that the best way to kind of assess the forage availability on a body of water? For, for an angler, it, it is. I mean, you, you have to visually find these fish. Um, for a scientist, we would use sampling methods such as traps, seines. Uh, shoreline seining is a really great way. I don't know that, that many anglers that are targeting, uh, you know, bigger advanced size fish are going to spend 30 minutes to an hour 
saning just to find out that forge is available and ruining a, a great spot. Right. So your electronics are kind of your underwater eyes. You can you can use those to find fish. I I also think that um, maybe one of the things you shouldn't do is you know I talked about well if if somebody's stocking forge that could be a really uh, big bonus something that I would key on. I would not necessarily look for somebody who's been stocking F ones or largemouth genetic um, into a fishery. And the reason I say that is just the uh, probability that those fish would enter into a system and grow at an exponential rate compared to the native fish that are already there um, is, is fairly unrealistic because there's no environmental change to spark that growth. So as an angler, like paying attention to what your state is doing will help you, but also don't just, just chase the next F1 stocking truck like that. That is not going to work. So, you, you, you're from Texas, and you're familiar with the the tanks that they have. I mean, they call ponds tanks in Texas, right? Um, you know, so you're familiar with that. But what about the guy that's living in Illinois or Indiana or Wisconsin? Uh, what would what would they look for? And I said, guy, it could be a, a, a lady, you know, a girl. Uh, what should they look for with respect to, you know, ponds or small bodies of water in their area to increase their odds of catching a personal best six pound to eight pound fish? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. You know, I think it, my gut tells me you don't want a fishery that ices over for a long period of time. If it has a, a small impoundment that ices over, has the potential to have fish kills especially if you have ice with snow compact on top. Uh, so you want fisheries that, you know, are, are maybe in a latitude where ice doesn't occur for, you know, 60 to 90 days. It's, it's a shorter window. Um, you want fisheries that do have, like, like what you were talking about, the cattails or some sort of emergent plant that, that is going to provide habitat or um, maybe experiences some sort of drawdown. A drawdown is something that we don't think of as an angler as a tool, but a drawdown allows a new lake effect or a pulsing effect to occur. And in some of these, uh, in some of these states where we're, we're purposefully drawing water down, um, that process would help us grow these exceptional fish. Let's talk about time of year, Stephen, if you don't mind. Everybody seems to uh, want to target these fish uh, around the spawn, probably especially in right. the, the pre-spawn. And when I look at the list of the, the biggest largemouth bass ever legitimately certified, uh, almost all of them were caught in the first six months of the year. You've right. got uh, Manabu Carita, who's caught in early July. you got Anthony Denny, the state record of Mississippi, who's caught in the last day of the year, I think 1992. But, but just about all these other fish are caught in the, the first six months. And they tend even then to be to be front loaded between say late January and uh, maybe early April. Is that is that the best opportunity to go after a fish, or is that just the convergence of anglers in shallow water and fish being in the shallow water at that time? I think you have both there, kid. Um, you know, whenever you talk about a large mouth specifically, or or even a small mouth, you're going to have an increase in egg mass as you come out of winter. Uh, those fish are also going to need to forage before they go spawn. Uh, so they're going to increase their, their weight for a short, short duration. And then you have the window immediately after the spawn where the fish is very vulnerable. It's recovering. Uh, we do know that, that during that recovery phase, they consume a lot of forage, but they do it in a way that doesn't expend a lot of energy. Uh, so maybe they're not as, as you know, easy to catch. Um, and then as we increase into summer, the summer months become stressful because the fish have to go into a survival mode at some point. You get, especially in your southern latitudes, you get that temperature range where a, a fish spends just as much time trying to survive and consume oxygen as it does trying to consume forage. Uh, now, conversely, you have the fall, and the fall is a, a kind of underexploited uh, time of the year. You know, you have fish that are they're gorging themselves before winter. They're traveling in schools to where if I catch, you know, a four pound fish, I, the next cast, I may catch an eight pound fish because they, they converge together. 
uh, right before winter. And, and that offers a lot of opportunity to find a lot of fish, but you're going to have to do it offshore. Uh, and I think our technologies right now are starting to kind of align and bring anglers offshore and provide that fall. And, and unfortunately, you're going to have to get out of the tree stand. You're going to have to be on the water. I, I I can't hit it. I can't flip from a tree stand, so I don't I don't do yeah. that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I love hunters. I love hunters because yeah, anybody, I don't hunt. <laughs> well, you know, it's, one of the things that's always troubled me is guys will say, "Oh, they're they're bigger in the spring." Well, that can't be true. I mean, a fish that a fish that you could have caught right before the spawn, that fish is necessarily larger. I would think uh, at some point in the summer, or certainly at some point in the fall. Um, Maybe it's a little bit leaner in the summer, but it's putting on length maybe or something like that. Is that not is that not the case? I love this question. Okay, so bass grow through a process called indeterminate growth, which means there's no age correlation to length or weight. So it doesn't matter. It's based solely on what the fish eats. So as okay. it consumes forage. Now, a, a large mouth has to consume 10 pounds of forage to gain one pound in a year. It also has to consume five pounds of forage to maintain its current weight per pound of body weight. So we start talking about these lean fish that are longer, skinnier fish. Those fish are lying to you, Ken, because their length had to match the weight that they had to be to be that length. So what those fish did is they gained weight first grew to that length that was proportional to their weight and then lost weight and that's why I they're see. long skinny fish so I, I i got you that that makes a lot of sense now so, one of the things when you were last on on the big bass podcast with us steven you we talked a little bit about uh additional weight due to the row during the spawn right and i know a lot of guys uh like to like to say oh that, that fish would have been three pounds heavier in the spring and and but you and you gave us a a, a great guideline for that Yep, and, and we use that 10% rule to where 10% of the body weight is, is made of eggs. But like I said last episode, you know, a, a large mouth as it increases in size has more eggs and larger eggs per pound of body weight. So that 10% tries to cover all size classes. But as we get to those bigger fish, a larger percentage of their weight could be egg mess. Okay. So, so like a 13-pound a fish would have 1.3 pounds of egg mass. Right. Maybe a little yeah, more. That would be a generalized rule. And then yeah. you also, one thing we don't think about as anglers is a large mouth uh, that weighs X pounds consumes forage that could be, you know, a, a up to 5% or so of its body weight at a time, at a single time, because they consume forage not by taking bites out of things, but by whole body consumption. And so if they are consuming large sunfish, gizzard shad, trout, their weight could very well be dictated on when was their last meal item and, and how far is that through the digestive process. You gave us a, a stat a minute ago that's fascinating to me. You said uh, a bass has to consume 10 pounds of forage to gain one pound of weight. And just in thinking about it that way, it's kind of intimidating to me because 10 pounds of forage does not seem like a lot, but a right. pound of growth for a year in a year is pretty, pretty good clip. So right. these fish are actually eating perhaps significantly less often than I ever imagined. Yeah. Well, we think about our reservoirs across the United States and our reservoirs average. If you take Northern Southern latitude, you take them all going to average about a half pound of growth a year on a large mouth. So a half pound of growth, um, on a one pound large mouth that needs 10 pounds of forage, right? We, we covered that. Well, they're eating about a three inch forage item and a three inch forage item weighs about 30 individual items per pound. So it takes 300 forage items to gain one pound. Now we average half pound growth, which means they're eating about 150 forage items if we simplify it as much as we possibly can. When I was 12, I had a, a, a an epiphany kind of moment. I lived on a farm, and we had a pond, and uh, I was into fishing. And, 
and the fishing wasn't very good in the pond and my parents called the SC South Carolina Department of Natural Resources and the actual state biologists came out there and they stained a section of the pond and so forth. It made such an impression on me and I was just there just watching with rapt attention. And one of the things the guy said to me at the time, and uh, I'll never forget it, and I want to see if it's still the prevailing view. He said a, a largemouth bass will target primarily long slender bait that's about that's up to maybe a third of its length. Is that still right. the generally perceived rule? Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Uh, you can look at the mouth gape. The mouth gape of the fish determines basically what it can swallow. Um, you know, the word target is tough because bass don't just consume forage out of hunger. Uh, they react to forage, their curiosity, they even compete for forage. You know, if another bass makes a move towards a forage item, it will trigger a response from another from other fish. Uh, so they don't always feed out of hunger. Uh, therefore, they don't necessarily target things based on... Uh, I'm hungry, I'm going to eat, and I need to eat something a third of my body weight. But that's a great rule, is it can consume that item, yes. And I'm sorry, Terry, I'm, I keep asking all these questions here, uh, but they, they tie into each other, I promise. Um, that's okay. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that made an impression on me about, about it being a third of the body length is it gave me the idea at a very young age that we're fishing lures that are, are very, very small relative to the size of the bass we'd like to catch. Yeah, yeah is that that's, a fair statement? that's true. That's true, and you really cannot um, fish them fast enough if, if you think about it. A, a largemouth will swim two and a half times its body length per second. So if you start to figure that out, it, it can be uh, up to about 10 miles per hour. And when we think about the burst speed of a largemouth being that fast, it's like, I don't have a reel that goes that fast. Exactly. Well, yeah, I've had a, a, a very well-regarded biologists who I think you know tell me that we don't have reels fast enough to trigger a true reaction strike based on speed alone. Right. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why competition becomes very important. When you have two bass together, it's easier to catch one of them. Fascinating. I'm sorry, Terry. I've been, yeah. I've been monopolizing the conversation. That's all right. That's all right. I had a bunch of questions and I forgot them all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm back then. It's, so, it's my turn so again. It, it's your turn pass. again, Ken. You know, our, okay. our, our audience understands the dynamic that we have here. So, <laughs> so you know, we in, in, in the last time you were on, Stephen, we talked a little bit about the depth in a lot of the waters that uh, have produced record class fish in the past. How important is, is and, and you talked earlier about ice and ice over and avoiding the lakes, that ice over for extensive periods of time. How important is, is depth? In, in trophy bass production, and what would you consider to be an adequate depth uh, in different parts of the country? Yes. Okay, great. Big, so long, tedious question. Long, but it's okay. It's depth, right? Uh, we're going in-depth on it. So, there you go. <laughs> all right. So um, it depends on the time of year, kid. So if, if we take the southern United States and we say, in the southern United States, we're going to have a summer thermocline that is most likely going to produce a oxygen zone and then a non-oxygenated zone. So we'll have surface water that's oxygenated and below that, at some point, we will have non-oxygenated water below the thermocline. So what do we got? Hypolimnion, thermocline, epilimnion? Epilimnion, yes, yep. Yep, that's okay. exactly right. So in the Southern United States, we will most often have that occur. Now you could take uh, another simplified measure you look at water clarity, multiply that by three, and that's about how far sunlight will penetrate and therefore where the thermocline will actually exist. And then... But I have, a, I have a question. So the, the, definition, of, the definition of thermocline yep. is the region in the water column where the temperature drops one degree Celsius per one foot of the depth. That's uh -huh. the formal definition. And right. I have actually seen... Uh, ther multiple thermoclines on deep lakes. Absolutely. Right? But then wow. okay. but then you have a clear, you're talking California, you have a clarity yeah. that allows sunlight penetration to 25, 30 foot. Right. In, in southern reaches of the United States, our clarity is 18 inches to two foot. 
And so therefore thermoclines will build somewhere between six and eight feet. And so because we don't have enough sunlight penetrating into the water to allow multiple thermoclines to exist. Uh, and we use thermocline as a generalized rule for things like oxycline, where oxygen gradients occur. We, we do this all the time. Uh, yeah. But with the thermocline, to simplify it, you're, you're exactly right, Terry. You need that temperature change. <clears throat> but depending on your visibility, you may have multiple layers to it. In the furthest southern reaches, uh, or like, like say, Texas, Oklahoma, like that, that area, what you're going to end up with is a thermocline that limits the depth that the largemouth bass can be in in the summer. Be because of the lack of oxygen. Because of lack of oxygen. Now, they're going to live on that thermocline, and they're going to move below it uh, for, for a short amount of time, but they can't live down there. So whenever we talk to Ken's question of depth, depth would be determined in those southern reservoirs by where the thermocline occurs because that's the usable depth. What you're talking about in California or as we move further north and we have increased water clarity and, and decreased temperature, summertime temperature, depth becomes less relevant if I'm asking about a limiting factor of where those fish can occur. Right, but I just wanted to point that out, that you have a difference in water bodies because, you know, yep. people in California in the summertime, I mean, we're, we're fishing, we don't even call water deep until it gets deeper than 35 foot, you know, and, and that a lot of the times is below the first thermocline, you know, Absolutely. you don't, you don't get to that oxygen depleted water until you're into the 80 or 90 foot range. And by that time you've gone through maybe two or three thermoclines. Right. So I, I, I just wanted to clarify that. You've also went through two barometric pressure changes. I mean, there's, exactly. there's a lot of things that, that occur. Yeah. Exactly. Because every, yeah. every 30 feet is one atmosphere uh, or 14.7 yeah. PSI. Uh, yeah. And that's why when you bring fish up from 80 foot of water, their swim bladder sticks out their mouth or their eyes pop out. Right, right. So. And I think maybe, Ken, the better part of this question to bring the audience back to it would not be depth, but actually maybe it's water clarity and color. Those become bigger indicators where when we are talking about fisheries that we want to avoid would have high turbidity. High turbidity is going to limit production. It's going to, it's going to decrease your carrying capacity. Um, especially if that turbidity is sustained all year long. If it's a pulsar turbidity that happens after a big flood, that becomes less relevant. Um, conversely, a, super clear, well, ahead, super yeah. clear water. I was, I was going to, yeah. Super clear water also limits your carrying capacity because it hinders your food chain. So there is a window of clarity somewhere between 18 inches and five foot of visibility on these larger reservoirs where we have the right amount of phytoplankton production to produce the forage fish that would then in turn produce these exceptional largemouth we're trying to target and not try to put a hard and fast rule on this because i realize there's a lot of a uh, gray area but yeah. generally speaking you would say perhaps that that a, a lake with turbidity year round of a where you have visibility of a foot or less is probably not going to be your best candidate as a trophy producer is that fair that's that's definitely fair you'll have a few exceptional individuals but your overall density of largemouth bass or or smallmouth would be lower uh, per acre than fisheries that aren't turbid. You mentioned so I have. Go ahead, Ken. No, uh, you're up, Terry. You're up. I've asked uh, the last nine. <laughs> strip pits. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, strip pits are found throughout the United States. Uh, they've got a ton of them down in Florida where they're mining phosphate. Uh, they have a ton of them in you know the Midwest where they're mining gravel for you know. Right. For, for example, strip pits always seem to produce big fish. Yes. And so my idea of that now, based on the conversation that you just had with Ken, is that it has to do with the water clarity because I've never seen a strip pit that didn't have clear water. Yeah, they have, they have clear water, but they also have some natural fertility um, to where they'll have times where you'll see pulses in plankton that will occur they also have, uh, because of that clarity, they have the deeper water that can still have oxygen. So the fish can escape 
summertime stress uh, a lot better. So there's the strip pit is a great example. The limiting factor there is habitat. Um, you could start talking about how they don't have great sites for fish to recover or ambush habitat to where they can they can capture forage quickly because uh, they'll usually be vegetation limited. They won't have you know timber in them. You know, maybe we'll have some rock piles, uh, but that becomes their limiting factor. And that's really the key to this whole conversation, guys, is if we look at a fishery and we say, what positives does it have? We could also say, what is its limiting factor? And if it has more positives than limiting factors, then it would become a fishery that I would want to target. Okay. Fabulous stuff. Uh, I want to go back to uh, a comment we were talking earlier about time of year. And yep. uh, obviously in the springtime pre-spawn, the bass have these big distended bellies and perhaps they're 10% heavier than they might be uh, uh, uh. immediately after the spawn and so forth. Why is it so tough to find and catch these fish in the fall? That seems to be the worst season of the year, uh, at least in the Southeast for, for catching big fish. I don't know why you keep doing that. My favorite month to fish is November. Uh, but is that for numbers or for, for size? both yeah both i mean you can you can find now a fish is not going to be at its maximum weight for that year in november that is true that fish will maximize its weight sometime in january or february but that fish is going to be actively feeding so if i wanted to grow or catch a double digit fish or the next world record it's probably not going to happen in the fall but if i wanted to catch an exceptional fish that's six to eight pounds well, the fall is a great time to target those fish because they're more apt to bite. And whenever you can target them, you're more apt to catch multiple of them. So it depends if, and this is, whenever we sit down with a client, the first question I say is, what, what is your goal? And they hit me with, I want a trophy fishery. And I say, great, what's a trophy fish? Because I'm talking to two guys right now that a trophy fish has to be, top notch let's talk about 14 15 pound fish well you know actually we're pretty flexible on that uh, at some point <laughs> we want we want to do i think it, i think the uh, smallest state record of any species is like the tennessee red eye it weighed a buck and a half or something like that right. and we will get to that story because that is a giant in that in that That's environment a, and of that, that species is, yeah. so we yeah exactly that one too, but but yeah we're but, you know, chicks dig lunkers steven you know that I know that, man. That's how you get them, right? No, but qualifying... That's why you went with, into this, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Qualifying the question with what is going to be the trophy size fish we're targeting would help us answer the question. I, I think the fall is a great time of year to catch quality largemouth. Uh, and, and it's I a guess phenomenal what, time to catch smallmouth. Right. When I, when I talk about the optimal time to catch fish and, and trophy fish, I'm really talking about the biggest fish in that region... Probably, I'm talking largemouth in, in this case. We want to get you back on to talk smallmouth later on. But um, so if, if, if your goal were to catch a largemouth bass at its peak, at its maximum weight, when would you recommend to go? And you can make it relative to the spawn or relative to the hottest part of the summer or however you can best define that for us. Yeah, I would say water temperature 55 degrees. Ah. Water temperature 55 degrees. They're moving their maximum weight and their their feeding and the females are going to be going to spawn within five degrees they're gonna those biggest females in your environment spawn first they spawn before we even think about going to sight fish and they're not going to do it in four four foot of water they're going to do it in eight foot of water they're going to do it in an obscure place because those are survival fish i mean we didn't talk about it last time but one of the things I always love talking about is the probability to even becoming that size of a fish. And whenever we, whenever we like do the math, it, it's literally one in 150,000 fish that have the potential to become these double digit size fish to live 10 years and be these advanced size fish. You shared a chart with us that, that reveals yep. some of those numbers and they're daunting. Uh, and depressing <laughs> to a degree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, uh, you know, it depends on how you want to do it. Uh, let's say you have a largemouth bass can produce 2,000 to 7,000 eggs per pound of body weight. And in my chart, I give you a 10-pound bass. And I say, we have a 10-pound female. 
And so she has between 20 and 70,000 eggs that go into that into that spawning cycle. It's not going to happen in one spawn. It, it happens in that cycle. Now, 1%, and I'm being very generous with 1%, 1% of those fish live to be one years old. In a lot of our reservoirs, that's a half a percent or less. But 1%, so we're already down to 200 to 700 fish out of that original 20 to 70,000. And then in most of our reservoirs in the United States, our mortality can be as high as 50% per year per age class. So we'll lose half of our fish on every age class. So then you start talking about, well, how do I get to, how many of those 70,000 fish would ever get to be 10 years old? And we're talking about one fish. And then, shocker of all shockers, only female largemouth get above six pounds. So <laughs> that one fish may have yeah. been disadvantaged from the beginning with being a male fish. So there is yeah, no so male privilege in this case. Oh my goodness. <laughs> no, not at all. So so what is the is there a ratio of let's say, you know, twenty thousand eggs get dropped on a bed, they right. all get fertilized. Correct. Uh, what is the ratio of male to female? Do is there such a? Is, is, can we figure that out scientifically? Is it fifty fifty? Is it twenty five percent male, seventy five percent female? What what is it? Terry, a lot of it has to do with temperature. Um, ah. The temperature at which the egg was laid will change how many percentage male versus female we have. Uh, wow. So. Right. So, and that's not controlled by the large amount. Like they're, they're not thinking of this and producing us more females, but. So the, there's the no male sperm and female sperm like there is in. No, though there British, definitely is. The temperature that... But sex change can occur in fish. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. I think we just yep. got a new, uh, <laughs> a, a new group of people to subscribe. Yeah. yeah. Sex change can occur in fish and it, and it happens. Um, so you can have a higher percentage come off of the nest as, as one female or male. You know, we typically talk about a 50-50 ratio because it makes it so simple. Uh, right. But that that doesn't necessarily have to be true. Okay. Yeah. So the colder the temperature, the more females. The hotter the temperature, the more females. It, Is there it, any it scientific... On... Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of research on it, and there and it's very dependent on species. And we're talking we're not talking like hotter or colder. We're talking like one degree Celsius or two degrees oh, Celsius. Wow. Like small changes will affect those things. Uh, and then, you know, you have you have the number that hatch. Uh, then you have the number that swim up, right? And and they do their first swim up. Then you have the number of fish that that can survive from swim up to winter and winter is the real killer because winter dictates how many fish survive in that year class and so it it, it that first year of life like i said one percent is very generous of even a, a single spawning um it's very very generous wow yeah so that's why places like florida have more fish density than other places north or you know north of Florida maybe because well, they don't their winter is really you know summer anywhere else right yeah they don't have as much winter mortality but they would have a higher cannibalism Predat predatory um, predatory loss and they they do have more aquatic vegetation which increases their survival but slows their growth so they stay in a vulnerable size longer uh, because of that aquatic vegetation. Now, once they can once they can consume uh, larger food items, so the switch to consuming fish is really important because um, once the largemouth goes through swim up, then the next thing it's going to start eating is like zooplankton, and then it will start macroinvertebrates, and it may stay in that for until it's about three inches in length, and so how long does it take it to grow three inches in length is how how long does it take to consume enough forage to get to that size in some of those environments with a lot of macrophytes it becomes harder or a lot of aquatic plants it becomes harder for them to consume enough of the plankton because the plankton don't exist because right. 
the plankton's competing it's with. Well, no, no, because the plankton's competing with the aquatic plant for the same nutrient to grow. So when you oh. have aquatic plants, you have clearer water. So it slows down the growth of those fish initially. Now, once they can switch to consuming other fish, they have a lot of little fish that they can then consume because there's so many in that environment. So it's this paradox of Florida, slow initial growth, huge spike in growth, depending on vegetation density, home range, and it, it, you know if it's over 30% of an area, going back to that, uh, they will have slow growth again. So Florida is an anomaly. All right. And so, to, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Ken. Well, I, I might be changing the subject a little bit, but I think I'm tying into what you were saying about uh, them eating fish. Uh, at a young age, uh, Glenn Lau tried to raise a world record for a while. He got up, Glenn told me he got up to about 18 pounds. And uh, he told me that the the fry that did the best, that had the greatest propensity for growth, were the ones that became cannibalistic earlier, earliest. Absolutely. And I think in our conversations earlier, you, you confirmed that. So and that's tying into what you're saying here. Fascinating. Fascinating stuff. So so the question that I have is going to kind of wrap this this up. Is there a formula that you could use to the viewers uh, that would, you know, help them determine the best body of water to catch a personal best or, you know, a, a, a fish in the northern climbs, you know, up over six pounds and the southern climbs over 10? Is there a formula that you, you, you could give people uh, right. that, would, that would help them with that? So maybe not a formula, Terry, but how about uh, advice? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, because we're not, thing, you know, I don't know how many people could do algebra that, you um, know. Yeah, yeah. The, <laughs> I'm, the I'm first writing. Thing, I'm writing. Okay. The first thing I would do as an angler is I would be highly observant. Okay. That's the most important trait we can have. We can be highly observant. I'm going to avoid bodies of water that, as you've learned tonight, tend to have slower growth rates. So that's turbid water. That's excessively clear water with high amounts of aquatic vegetation, like in the 80, 90% range. That's too much. That's also bodies of water where we don't see forage available. We don't see birds along the shoreline. We don't see forage on our electronics. I would tend to target, like Ken says, areas where I can seasonally fish it early in the year because I'm going to have a better chance of that exceptional individual. And then the last thing I would avoid is areas that have a high angler pressure because high angler pressure, the fish, although they can't learn, they will be lure shy. And so I would look Conditioned. for, yep, I would look for environments where I can be one of the few anglers that are experiencing this. That may be small impoundments on private water, if you get permission to fish them. That may be areas within reservoirs where people just don't tend to go fish. It is too hard to get to. We see, you know, the great things Keith Poche has done recently on the Bass Pro Tour, running up river to places people don't want to be. Think about those untapped environments and go take advantage of them. Awesome. Absolutely fabulous stuff. Stephen awesome. Barden, we got I got so many more things I want to talk with you about. <laughs> uh, you have a, you have an amazing, uh, uh, a remarkable, special, cool, uh, insightful opinion about which record will be broken first, the large mouth or the small mouth. We want to get into that at some point. We're going to tackle that David Hayes story very soon. Um, we we got to have you back. So uh, thank you so much for your time and, and for yeah, joining absolutely. us again on the Big Bass Podcast. You're you're terrific. Thank you guys for having me. I, I say it every time. I, I subscribe to the show. I love this. This is my favorite podcast to listen to. Uh, it is definitely worth the hour every single week. You guys keep it up, and I'll, I'll be a big fan. Well, Thank you, ironically, sir. if you listen to this, this is like one of our best shows, so you should definitely listen to this multiple times. <laughs> so narcissistic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I promise I won't listen to it. I promise. Ah, we, we need we need this we need the clicks. Come on, man. Uh, oh, I'll let it play. I'm just not listening because I'm sure that I'm sure that I'll have to listen to one of Terry's jokes or or go. Dang, Ken didn't oh, let Terry talk enough. Uh, I'm trying to preserve the listenership we have by cutting Terry off at every opportunity. Uh, anyway, Stephen, thank you so much. Uh, Terry, can you take us home? 
Yeah, it's uh, time to slam the door on this episode of the Big Bass Podcast. But before we go, please remember to subscribe, uh, like, share, comment below in the comment section on YouTube. Uh, we love talking to you folks. Uh, don't forget to check out the website, uh, thebigbasspodcast.com. Uh, we have the Bass, uh, the Big Bass po- uh, Podcast calculator uh, and listings of a record bass for every state. Uh, and other supplementary material and episodes. It's kind of a work in progress, uh, but we, we, we promise that uh, at, at some point in the near future, it is going to be the place to go uh, to, to do research on big fish throughout the U.S. or in your area. If you want to contact us, our email addresses are ken at thebigbasspodcast.com, terry at thebigbasspodcast.com, and nathan at thebigbasspodcast.com. Again, I'm Terry Battisti, uh, and on behalf of my partners, Ken Duke and Nathan Benson, and our special guest, Stephen Barden, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, be sure to check back next week. Uh, we'll have a new show with a story that you will not and cannot find anywhere else. And remember, size does matter. <laughs>